Hey everybody, how are we doing today? We are starting a new series today. We're excited about looking at the letter of First Peter in the New Testament. And so we are calling this series Exiles. And I think it'll become evident why as we dive into this here in a minute. But let me say a prayer for us uh, before we start today and just ask God to come and be with us. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for your word that we can look at it today. Thank you for each person who is uh, using this media to listen to your word. I pray that you would come in power by your spirit and do what only you can do. Thank you that we, uh, again, have some time together in First Peter. Would you bless this series and use it to open our eyes to your truth and how we can live in this world. And uh, we'll give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians 3.20 says this, Our citizenship is is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we go into this election year, and as we approach many cultural issues that we are and will need to confront, uh, we think about things like eclipses coming up and signs of the times. I had a friend come in this week and was telling me, you know about this eclipse coming up? And that's why I heard about it. And he, he was saying that, you know, all these things are lining up and the planets are going to be, I was like, I don't know anything about that. And he said, Jesus is coming back and this is a sign of it. And so I don't know what you think about all that, but we're, 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 we're coming obviously every day closer to the end of when Jesus will return. I I think it's a great time to study First Peter with all this stuff going on. And this short letter can show us how to live as followers of King Jesus here now today. And we need to return, I think, I need to return as living as resident aliens, as foreigners, as strangers, as, as we're calling it, exiles in another country. I'm not saying you need to leave your country, but wherever you're living, you ought to be a stranger there. We don't belong here, but we are here. Uh, we can live and serve our king, as I say around here all the time, as missionaries to California. And I think the church, a city on a hill, will shine brighter and brighter as things get darker. And that light will impact and chase the darkness out. I came across a story this week studying. This is written by uh, R.C. Sproul, if you've heard of that name. Listen to this. It says, my wife, Vesta, which is kind of a cool name, and I were traveling from Hungary into Romania right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So this is back in the early 90s, I guess. We were warned about the great dangers of going across the border, as the border guards tended to be overtly hostile towards Americans. We were riding in an old train from Budapest to cluj nabokov in Romania, and we came to the border between Hungary and Romania. Two burly border guards got on the train, where there were four of us, Vesta, me, and another couple, in gruff, broken English. The guard told us to empty our suitcases. So just as we were about to follow his command, their leader looked at our friend and leaned forward, and she had a Bible in a brown paper bag on her lap. He grabbed the Bible from the bag, and he said in broken English, you know Americans. I should have done a better accent for you there. We had our passports that identified us as Americans, but he questioned us about our citizenship. He pointed his finger at the Bible text and said, look what it say. And then he said this, we are pilgrims and citizens of heaven. He was a Christian. He turned to the other guards and he said, these people, okay, leave them alone. So we made it through the checkpoint, but we experienced what it means to be pilgrims, sojourners in a foreign land, yet members of the kingdom of God and citizens of heaven. I thought it was a great story. Or as we go into First Peter, we're going to see a lot of themes and, and the purpose of the book and all that. But I want to read our verses. We're only going to look at two verses today. We're actually going to look at a few more. But the, the text of First Peter, just the very beginning, today is going to be an introduction on the whole book or letter. It says this. If you have a Bible, go ahead and pause it and you can grab that out. But look at First Peter 1 and just verses 1 and 2. It says this. Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who are elect exiles, or excuse me, the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, or Bithynia, I think is how you say that, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So it's just a couple of verses, but we want to look at a few questions. Who wrote it? Who is the audience? Who is it written for? And then why was it written? What was, it, what was going on? Why did Peter write this? So let's just break it up like that, these three questions. And you'll see some, I think, some application along the way as well. First, who wrote it? Well, it says, it's pretty obvious, it says, Peter, an apostle of Christ. 
Um, and even though people have debated, like, was this really this Peter? When was it written? And there's all this back and forth on it. Um, I believe it's written by the Apostle Peter that was with Jesus. So he's one of the 12. Remember, he's the, the passionate, often impulsive disciple. One of the first two to be called by Christ with his brother, Andrew. Uh, he says this in Matthew four eighteen: follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets because they were fishers of fish, right? And so they, they were fishermen. Uh, this is a guy that walked on water for a time going after Christ out on the water. He fought for him. And then after Christ ascended, after he had been murdered and buried and raised on the third day, he preached some powerful sermons. He was the one that would, Jesus would use to help establish the church along with others. And then eventually he would be crucified outside of Rome near the end of Nero's rule. So Peter, this is the guy who wrote this. Listen to this. This is also from R.C. Sproul. I won't quote him all day, but I like the way he put this together. He says, Peter the impetuous, Peter the bold, the one at Caesarea Philippi who made the great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The big fisherman who gave his life being a fisher for men. The one who paradoxically refused to acquiesce to Jesus' teaching immediately after the Caesarea Philippi confession, where he said, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, saying, this shall not happen to you. Because he said, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and beaten and, 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 and be murdered. He said, this shall not happen to you. So in a matter of minutes, this is the last part of the quote, Peter went from being the rock, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, to being the spokesman of Satan. Um, remember he said, get behind me, Satan, when he said that? You're like, whoops. Um, then he said, from the blessing that Jesus gave to him, saying, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And again, this dreadful rebuke later, that get behind me, Satan. This is Peter. So this is the same one who would follow Jesus to the death. When Jesus told him he would deny him three times, he protested with all his might, I will never deny you. But then he, of course, did. Uh, the one who vacillated, but nevertheless, over the course of early church history, he did become a rock and a leader who remained faithful to his death. So it's ironic that Peter writes to those suffering persecution, and he says, as we're going to see in the letter, don't think it's strange that you should have to suffer. He understood what Jesus said about the cost of discipleship eventually in his life. So Peter's intimate knowledge of persecution it comes across here with a pastor's heart in First Peter. So we're going to see this. But as Peter wrote this, um, he is encouraging these churches to stand firm. So the the the, the author, it's Peter. Um, and we'll, we're, we're going to touch on his life a bunch because it comes out in the way he writes and in the things he writes about. Um, and so we'll come back to him over and over again. But how incredible to have this letter from one of the one of the guys that walked around with Jesus, saw him through it all and even through the death and the resurrection and then saw the, the spirit come upon them in Acts 2 and then the church was launched out um, and he would live his life out doing this thing that Jesus told him to do. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and I am with you always to the end of the age. This, this hope, this promise is all throughout of Jesus being with us to the very end. And we'll see it over and over again in Peter. But who is he writing to? Uh, there's there's uh, the first part, or uh, second part, excuse me, of that verse. It says, to those, this is verse one still, who are elect exiles of the dispersion. I want to stop there for a minute. And we'll talk about the, those areas that are mentioned, Pontius, Galatia, etc. But he uses these three strong nouns. He says, elect exiles of the dispersion. What is he talking about? Well, the first thing, elect, it means chosen. Throughout the Bible, chosen is like it's an intimate term God most often uses to talk about those that he loves. It's covenant language. Like, you're my people and I am your God. Uh, listen to Deuteronomy 7, 6. You're a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you. This is that, that elect word. To be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, he's chosen you. And it's not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, this covenant that he made, 
that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the house of the hand, or excuse me, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So he's saying, you're the chosen ones of God. These are people that have been saved, Peter's saying. The term elect here, it's meant to encourage and remind us about God's steadfast love that we just read about, his great love for us. And that, that love is offered to everybody. But he's writing to people that have already become Christians. And he's saying, elect I'm writing to you elect people, the ones that have been chosen by God's incredible love. You've responded to God's offer of love and accepted that. So it's meant to encourage them in that. That's just one word, elect. But then he says exiles. Um, the name elect before was, you know, chosen, was given to the whole household of Israel. And as you know, history shows that Israel began to kind of presume upon God's grace. They went back on their commitment to fulfill and obey all these commandments. Um, as special objects of his love, they kind of assumed that it would always be theirs. They would always know his goodness. And so in one sense, kind of their familiarity with God and his love worked against them. They felt they were entitled to a good life or the blessings of God, uh, even when they didn't do their part or they didn't care at the time or they didn't you know, follow God's commandments or respond to him in love. They worshiped idols and they walked away from God and they forsook his commandments. So presumptuous sin became the unfortunate companion of God's people in the Old Testament. During the days of the kings, remember, they turned away from God and, and forfeited even his glory. Like in Ezekiel, we see the glory go away, like leave the land. And as a result, what happened to them? They were carried off into what the Old Testament calls is exile. They were dispersed by God. The term exiles of the dispersion was now, for the first time, used talking about the elect. So it's this Old Testament language talking of this exile and elect coming together. What's going on here? Because to be in exile is to be rejected, and to be elect is to be chosen. So why is he putting these two together? It's kind of a strange way to say that. We don't really see this in the Bible in other places. Well, they're not like the exiles in the Old Testament. He doesn't mean that here. He's not saying that um, it's because of Israel's ancient sin or your own that you're exiled. It's not the result of disobedience to God, because in Peter, we see him affirming that they're standing strong, and he wants them to continue in that. They're living fruitful lives in obedience to, to Jesus. So how are they exiled and scattered and elect at the same time? What's going on here? Um, have you ever felt like really out of place, like you don't belong like, you, you're, I'm not from here kind of thing. You, you maybe done that when you went to a new town or, or visited people or maybe even another country um, or just been around people that are very different from you. Like, I don't, I'm not like these folks. They're, they don't think or act or talk the way I do. Um, we had the privilege of, uh, as you probably heard a million times now, live in Ecuador for a while. And, and we hosted a lot of teams and, and interns. And so part of the process when someone comes to visit, and we had the same thing when we first moved there, is like figuring out the lay of the land. Like, how do, what do people do here? Like, how do I act? How do I talk? What do I do? And there are some interesting customs that you probably would maybe find a little bit disgusting. One is toilet paper. You don't put it in the toilet. You put it in the trash can in Ecuador. That's just what they do. It takes a little while to get used to that. Another one that's not gross is when you greet someone, you give them a beso, like a kiss on the cheek. Um, and it's just what you do. Not men to men, but everyone else. You know, if you're uh, introducing yourself or, or greeting a lady or two ladies or greeting, they would do that. Um, and it got a little awkward at first, but you got used to it. When you walk in a room, you greet everyone in the room. That's just what you do. It's not the thing we do around here. We handshake or high five or hug sometimes maybe. Uh, one time we had come home to visit and we're actually here at the church. Pastor Ken was here. Great guy. I love Ken. Um, and my wife goes up to him and we had just gotten here Sunday morning. Hey, Ken. She runs up and she kisses him on the cheek. And he was like, what? <laughs> she was so used to basoing, kissing, uh, that she just smacked one right on him. And he was like, who is this crazy lady? Um, and she was like, oh, I'm sorry. And he, he understood. It was, it was good. I have to tell one more about me since I threw my lovely wife under the bus. Uh, we got to visit um, a church often in a, an area of Quito called Carmen Bajo. Uh, some of us have been there even at our church with groups before. Um, it's a really fun place. It's a Compassion International site. So they got kids everywhere and they, they do a feeding program, lunch. They have a school on campus and it's a church as well. So they got all kinds of stuff going on. So several times we'd go over there and, and just work with them and do whatever they were doing, kids programs or whatever. And, and a few times we would almost inevitably, we'd end up in the kitchen washing dishes because feeding the kids, that's a 
cleanup. That's something I could do. You know, I can't cook real well. So we're in there and it's, it just happens to be a group of ladies that do the cooking and the dishes. And so we'd be in there with them and they're hilarious. They're laughing and joking and just giving you a hard time and super fun to be around. They, they Their love for Christ is just bubbling out everywhere. And so they had this thing one day where they said, we're going to play Booga Booga. And I'm just learning Spanish. I don't know what Booga Booga is. And, and they said, they send everybody out of the room and they bring them back in one at a time. And they're going to do this game. And so I, I, I was a youth pastor um, for a long time. I've done goofy games to, with kids. And I, I know they're up to something. And so as I'm walking out of the room, I said this. Are you going to, or I said, I'm worried that you're going to acostarme. And what I meant to say was acosar. I, I had a T in there that wasn't supposed to be there. Again, I'm in language school every day. This is a weekend and we're trying to learn Spanish. I don't know what I'm doing. And what I accidentally said was, I'm worried that you're going to sleep with me. And what I meant to say was harass me. It's one letter off. Now, for a missionary who's recently moved to a country at a church at a Compassion National site to tell ladies in the kitchen, I'm worried you're going to sleep with me. That's a really bad idea to say. And they all kind of looked, they freaked out. And, and they were like, no, no, no. And I was like, I know I said the wrong word there. And it, it wasn't until later that I figured it out. And I went back and apologized. And they just laughed even harder. They were like, that's awesome. Um, luckily, God is gracious. And they were very kind people. I won't tell you what the game Booga Booga is. That's for another time. But um, they were trying to pull a trick on each of us. Um, so there have been times in my life where I felt extremely out of place. Living in another country like where you don't know what's going on, you have to learn a culture and language, is challenging and you, you don't fit in. But this is the idea here of exile. Exile is the normal state of any follower of Jesus living anywhere in the world. We're not supposed to feel like we're at home. We are not supposed to fit in. It's not our home. In a sense, the readers of First Peter are not that different from you and me. Um, listen to the way C.S. Lewis talked about this kind of normal condition of being in exile as a Christian. He says, at present, we're on the outside, or excuse me, the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor of it, that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in a similar sense that Peter's people were aliens in the empire. Their beliefs and practices were inevitably uh, remained radically at odds with their culture. So C.S. Lewis says, we will someday get in. Peter's people knew this. They're like, we're not in the kingdom yet. We're in the kingdom of this world. And how do we live here? Radically at odds. Christians are aliens and we are never going to fit in perfectly to a secular society. We can't laugh at every joke. We can't enjoy all the entertainment or whatever and pastimes that everybody does. Um, but this is the same way First Peter's people had it. They had different media than we have, but they were outsiders. Um, there's a book that came out recently. I haven't got it yet. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to get it. But it's called Life in the Negative World, Confronting Challenges in an Anti-Christian Culture. And the, the guy, Aaron, that wrote this, I don't, I don't know him, I just know his name, but he he's arguing that it used to be in our country that Christianity was kind of like common cultural values. You know, not everyone was a Christian, but people were, were, they were good with it. I was like, oh, yeah, you go to church, fine, that's great. Um, and it was, it was some of the values that Christianity brought into our country and kind of sustained, they were all just kind of assumed. But he's arguing that that day is no longer. Uh, people have a negative view of Christianity by and large in our country, more do now than ever before in history. And he said it's growing. And so his book argues positively, how do we, what do we do about that? How can we live and stand as light and love and, and reach our culture, uh, reach people in our culture? Um, and so as it grows, we're going to see more and more of the need for us to be aliens, to be exiles, to be strangers, to be foreigners. Um, so we're going to learn from Peter how to more and more stand out as strangers in our culture. And he promises us that though we're redeemed, our aliens now, we're foreigners now. I don't mean aliens like outer space. I mean like resident aliens. Um, we, we stand out now as strangers in our culture. Um, we have an inheritance, it says in verse 3. We're going to look at this next week. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So we do have a lot in common with the, the people of First Peter, even though it was thousands of years ago. In Christ, we are God's chosen, his elect in all the earth. 
and we're living our lives out in a complex and often confusing context. And Peter wants to say, I have help for you. The word of God is going to come. The spirit of God is going to come. So the last part, the scattered, the dispersion. It says in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, I have a couple maps up here. This is just uh, showing the kind of the ancient Near East, the, the world of the New Testament, um, especially the part Peter's talking about. And then there's another map that zooms in. These little provinces or areas are in modern day Turkey. Um, and so they were living in these areas and he was specifically addressing them. But this letter would be made available to the, the whole church, all the churches around. And the way he wrote his letter, it's addressed to them, but it applies to all Christians. It applies to the whole church. It doesn't focus like some of Paul's letters on specific problems like with Corinth. He goes through and addresses issues they're dealing with or Galatia. Galatians is written to to stamp out some heresy that was going on about how the Christians had to embrace Jewish cultural practices and rituals. Peter here is just more generally directed to the church. And even though he has this audience in mind, um, he's going to encourage these believers for the brutal times they live in. Uh, We're going to talk more later about the persecution under Nero and then the rulers that would follow him. But he's addressing these folks because they are already under persecution. It's actually going to get worse. So that's the dispersed people. These are Christians, these aliens, these these strangers, exiles spread out all over the place, especially in this region that's now Turkey. But that leads to the next question. Why was it written? This is where I think we'll get a little more uh, practical help. Uh, Not that knowing that Peter's writing to these suffering Christians isn't practical help. Why was it written? What, what's, what's, what's he getting at here? It says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now we're going to see this purpose and then many themes come out of the book uh, as we look through the letter. But verses 1 and 2 kind of provide a bit of a summary here, like a kind of some of the things he's going to talk about. He wants to give hope and encouragement to suffering Christians. So there, there are four things I just want to point out. The first one is this, to give hope and encouragement to suffering Christians. And, and also... Uh, to anticipate and accept the difficulties that are going to come. He wants them to know. He says things like, don't be surprised. Don't let it seem strange to you that you're suffering trials for following Jesus. I want you to see this coming. And they're going to encounter that. He says, because of your faith in Christ. He'll say things like, if you're, if you're being persecuted because you're just being stupid or foolish, then you should expect that. Um, and, you know, don't don't look at that as true persecution for Jesus. That's just because you did something dumb. But when you're suffering for Jesus, expect that to come. Jesus promised us that would come. Also, this word hope this is giving hope and encouragement. Hope is in here five times. He's going to come back to it over, 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 over again. He's going to call it a living hope. And I know I mentioned this, I think, either last week or the week before. But this word hope is not wishful thinking like I hope we don't get too much snow tonight, or I hope I get a good grade on this exam or this paper I turned in, or I hope to have a fun night tonight. This is hope in the certain fact of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and his return for us. And Peter's going to draw that out. I won't get into it more today. It's going to come out in the next passage for next week. A lot of people say this is a good summary of Peter. First Peter five twelve, kind of at the end, he says, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. Meaning the gospel, like stand firm in this, this, the gospel. And this is the hope that Jesus has already come and laid his life down for your sin. He was murdered, raised from the dead, and he's ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, and he's returning. So this is what you fix your hope in. The God himself that's done all this. So according to Peter, we are full identity as these elect exiles he just told us about to the mysterious plan of God. Did you hear the beginning of 1 Peter 1, 2? Um, It's no accident that he uses those three like concrete, solid words to say, um, you know, elect, exile, scattered or dispersed. But now he has these three phrases explaining how it came to be. And he starts with before the beginning, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So why was it written? The first thing was to give hope and encouragement. The second is to remind us that God is in control. And I would add, so we can trust him. He knows what he's doing. It says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Notice he mentions the Father here first. Uh, Foreknowledge is a word that kind of 
makes us our heads hurt a little bit. But this is God's plan of redemption that that was set in motion before the foundation of the earth, according to Scripture. Listen to uh, Romans eight twenty eight. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. This is one of those verses we pull out, and, and it's a great verse to, to, to talk about and use, but we say all things work together for good. And sometimes we do this when someone's hurting or going through a tough time, and it's true. It may, may not be the best time to share this verse with them if they're suffering or someone's just died or some gnarly thing has happened in their life. But it is true. It's good to know this verse right now if you're not suffering. So when you do, you can come back to it. But listen to how it continues. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So God set this plan in motion, predestined, foreknew, and the goal was for them to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among the many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, this Romans 8, this, this whole passage is saying the, the reason we know God is working all things together for good is because he's been, he's been working our lives far before we were ever even in existence. He wanted us to come to him, and then he called us to himself, and then he justified us, giving us that right relationship with him. And then it says, then he also is going to glorify. That's that day you're going to be in heaven, in the presence of God, standing before him without sin, without the struggles of this world. The curse has been reversed. The new heavens and the new earth are, are there before us. And he says, what do you say about that, basically? If God's for us, who can be against us? We have, we have nothing to fear. God is on our side. That's awesome. So, Peter's reminding us about that. He's saying, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Ephesians 1, 3 talks about it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's that conform to the image of Jesus thing again. Uh, in love... He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. That's into the family of God. Like, if you're in Christ, you're a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of the King. This is this, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father that Peter is talking about here. Then it says, according to the purpose of his will, he made that happen. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. That's capital B, that's Jesus. So, Paul and Ephesians are just praising God for his glorious grace. And that's that's this reminder that God is in control. He's got you. He's looking after you. We can trust him. There's two more. Not only does it give hope and encouragement, it reminds us that God is in control, but then it drives us to depend utterly on the Holy Spirit. It says, in the sanctification of his spirit. This sanctification is literally set apart or made holy. Uh, this, the Bible, I already mentioned one of them, but or actually two. Uh, it has this, this word salvation. It's, it says things like, you are saved, or you have been saved. Then it says, you are being saved. Then it also says, you will be saved. Those are all, I, I didn't look up the verses to share them with you today. I forgot to do that. But it says three tenses almost of salvation. There's past, there's present, and there's future. So the past is this justification we talked about a minute, we read about. You, you've been made right. Before God, when you confessed Jesus and trusted your life to him and, and handed it over and believed, you were saved. You have been saved. You're justified. But there's also this word sanctification. This is this being saved. We're being made more and more like Christ. It says here, in the sanctification of his spirit. So we've already seen the Father. Now we have the Spirit. But this sanctification, we already read the, word, the verse that says glorified. That's the day when you're perfected, completed, without sin. It's It's finished. So there's this past, present, and future tense of salvation in the words justification, sanctification, glorification. I don't know if you care about that kind of thing, but it, to me it helps to see the big picture of it. We're going to spend time on this as well because Peter gets into it when we're called to be holy as God is holy later in chapter 1. But the main desire and goal that the Holy Spirit has is to make us holy, set us apart, from the world and unto God. Conform us to the image of Jesus. Make us more and more like him. That's why you read in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. These are 
evidences that God is working out in our lives. If you're growing in patience, that's the Spirit's work. It's not you doing it. Definitely not in my life. If I get more self-control, I show love. I have peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. All those things are the fruit that God is working in us. And we have to depend upon and, in a sense, be co-workers with the Spirit and sanctification. Think about how you grow. Uh, you you read your Bible, you have to pick it up and start reading, or you spend time in prayer or meditating on the word or fasting for something. You're actively doing something or in fasting, not doing something, but the spirit is, is co-laboring with you in that, producing that fruit. And this idea of us being these exiles, it's, it's, it's to depend on the Holy Spirit. We, we live in this world that's not our home, it's getting, it seems like it's getting more and more messed up all the time. We're confronted with all these crazy challenges of culture and issues, and, and the Spirit is where we need to go. God, help me to walk in your Spirit. The Spirit produced the Word of God. We'll learn in Peter as well. So that's a part of this process too. Philippians 1, six has been one of my favorite verses for a long time because it's so reassuring to me. Paul wrote this, the apostle, says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. This is, the, this is our future. This is where we're going. And God is more concerned about this work in my life than I am almost all the time, uh, probably all the time. But God says, I want you to depend upon the Spirit here, in the sanctification of the Spirit. As you wait for Jesus to return, living in this crazy world, the Spirit is in you. That's why Jesus said to his followers, it's better that I go because I'm going to send you a helper. Sometimes I don't really believe that, but it's the truth. So I love this clear reference to the Trinity. We've already seen the Father, sanctification of the Spirit. Then he goes to Jesus. And this is the, the, um, the, the third of the, or the fourth of the, the things here that we're encouraged. So I got tongue tied there. So it's the, the hope we have, encouragement. Then it's the Father knows what he's doing, depend upon or trust him in that. And then run to the Spirit. And now it's just to motivate us to live for Jesus. The only two verses I know I've rambled on a lot. Not too, not too shabby. Uh, then it says, verse 2, for obedience to Jesus Christ. So in, later in 113, he's going to start to establish probably some pending questions. Like Peter's thinking, yeah, as you're reading this, you're uh, in light of these present trials, like we're suffering. How are we supposed to bear witness? Like, how do you do that? Um, how can we live in this crazy world as foreigners? I mean, it's just getting, it's getting crazier and crazier. Um, Peter focuses on later on a Christian's conduct. And that's what he's saying here, obedience to Jesus. This is, Jesus said things like, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. You'll obey my commands. You'll actually love my commandments. You'll fall in love with me so much that when I ask you to do something or not do something, absolutely, consider it done or consider it not done. Peter uses this word conduct. This, this word conduct in the New Testament, it shows up 24 times. I just learned this this week. 11 of these times, so almost half of them are in Peter. So he, he's got it several times in 1 Peter and three times in 2 Peter. He wants us to focus on conduct. Why is that? Is it just an external conduct he's concerned about? I don't think so. He's saying, my strategy for Christian conduct for you it's rooted in a settled hope. And he, he, he says the hope uh, comes from a focus on sanctification in 113. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. A sincere love for others, both in and out of the church. That's in chapter one and two. A submission even to unjust leaders because you love Christ and you're actually following him. Then he says a willingness to suffer. That's a massive theme in, in Peter. And then service to God's new family, like your faithfulness to the church. So he says this conduct matters. Think about those areas. As you're being made more and more like Christ, you're going to display that to the world. If you love people in and out of the church, people are going to see that love and be drawn to Jesus. If you stand in a society and a, a, a government even that's unjust and you follow Christ first, that's going to make an impact. If you suffer for Jesus, that's going to proclaim loudly what you really believe. So Peter, at the end here, throws in after for obedience to Christ, he says, and for sprinkling with his blood. There's a reference to the atonement, right? We talked about this in church last week, I think. Yom Kippur, the sprinkling of the blood on the altar for the covering of the sins of people. So it's talking about Christ fulfilling all that, the day of atonement, all the sacrificial system, um, the tabernacle, the temple, all of it. Jesus came to fulfill all of that. So, we will see later that the church is the new temple. And so he's just kind of throwing this in at the beginning. He's going he's gonna to develop it later. He says this in 1 Peter 2, 4, As you come to him, 
a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Then later in verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he's going he's gonna to unfold this the way Jesus has fulfilled all this and now is launching out the church's new temple. So just to point to the very end of his little opening here, the end of verse 2, the last phrase says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. His desire is that we would experience God's grace, know his peace, and he says, abundantly. May it be multiplied. He doesn't just say grace and peace to you. But he says, would it just overflow and abound in your life? So really, in, in one of the strongest ways possible, Peter says this, the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth is behind all of this. The hidden counsel of the eternal Trinity has planned for us to be known as his elect, his chosen exiles, chosen strangers, you could say, or aliens. And he has done all of this through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. So take heart, be encouraged. God knows what he's doing. Christians are those who are chosen by God and called to live in this world. There's something in this letter for all of us. I want to end with a blessing, kind of like Peter does here. I want to read from Jude 24 to, to close it out. It says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Let me say a quick prayer for us. God, thank you for this incredible letter that we get to study. And, and I know that in our time, in our life, uh, the world seems to be getting darker. And I pray that we would, as we submit to you and study your word and surrender to it, that the light would shine brighter through us, that you would enable us to make a difference for your kingdom uh, here in this world. We know your kingdom is here, but we ask that your kingdom would come. God, that the darkness would be pushed out. Thank you for uh, today that we can spend this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, just a quick note. Um, you will be most likely, if you're connected to the church, receiving a little update from John and Deb about her potential lung transplant in the future. So keep praying for them. And, and then keep Kevin and, and his need for a kidney on the list. We'll try to keep you updated there. But he's just kind of still in, in waiting mode. But I just want to give you a little quick family update on those two. Pray for them. Uh, send them a note if you get a, a chance. And uh, hopefully we can see you soon in person. Thank you. Thank you.